Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Early Mormon apostles B.H. Roberts, John A. Widsow, and James E. Talmadge seem to be very amenable to evolution. It seems like Joseph Fielding Smith, on the other hand, had an outsized influence on LDS thought and tended more towards a creationist stance. In our next conversation with Ben Spackman, we'll talk about that dynamic and how early leaders diverged and how it seems like Smith seems to have temporarily won the evolutionary debate. Check out our conversation. I'd also like to encourage everyone, if you'd like to hear this entire conversation uncut, please subscribe on our patreon.com slash gospel tangents page. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview uncut. Now back to our conversation. Well, so let me throw that out there. We talked about who won between Tertullian and Augustine. It sounds like Augustine won. Is that is that a fair statement? Well, well I, before you answer that, I also want to do this. Let's talk about Talmadge, Roberts, and Widsow, yeah. and Joseph Fielding Smith. It sounds like Joseph Fielding Smith won in a lot of in a lot of mind. In a well. lot of ways, I think he did. Um, if you want to be cynical. He kind of waited until his opponents died, and then he published Man, His Origin, and Destiny, which was kind of his young earth creationist book. And um, parts of that were written word for word 20 or 30 years earlier. None of his discussions with apostles, who were in some cases his senior, and had PhDs in relevant fields, shifted him one bit. Um, now, on the one hand, you can look at that as very admirable. His strength was, he thought, and rightly so, at least in this narrow way, what is important is that we're faithful to Scripture. Where that goes wrong, and I would disagree with it, is how he read Scripture. And there are other examples of this in LDS history. Um, I have made a very loose argument um, somewhere that um, in a way Joseph Fielding Smith was kind of the epitome of 19th century assumptions that Mormons had inherited. And these other three guys were outsiders in several ways. Um, Roberts and, well, first of all, they were all foreign, technically. Roberts was British, Talmadge was British, Witza was Norwegian. Hmm. So they were not raised in a set of 19th century American assumptions. They were getting 19th century European assumptions, which differed in some ways. They were all converts, and so they were not raised with um, what you might think of as religious Mormon assumptions that they would just start imbibing by osmosis, you know, from age three onwards in in church or something. And so... um, it's interesting that these three guys who are outsiders in significant ways are the ones who uh, oppose Joseph Fielding Smith's um, insider perspective. And by insider, I mean you couldn't be much more of an insider than Joseph Fielding Smith. I mean, by, by his position, by his family, by his history— he was just at the center, at well, the core. And let's talk about his family just a little bit there. Because right. Who was his father? So Joseph F. Smith was his father. Okay, the who prophet. was president of the church. And, um, and who was his father? Uh, Hiram Smith, Hiram if Smith. I remember correctly. That's right. I believe that's correct. And uh, I wrote a paper. It was one of my first grad school papers. And uh, I'm not sure it was anything new, but it was useful for me to kind of compile. Uh, I've spent a lot of time trying to get into Joseph Fielding Smith's head. Um what what drives him. And from several things in his life, uh, and this is, this is a loose suspicion. This is nothing solid to point at. But he, he had a very traumatic childhood. Um, first off, the government was often looking for his parents, and his parents were often absent or in hiding or off on missions. Um, in hiding? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, he grew up very poor. Even though his father was president of the church, he had very little money. And so uh, there's a story about him gifting Joseph Fielding Smith his own copy of the Book of Mormon. And uh, there were printing errors in it. I don't remember if some of the pages were bound upside down or something. But the reason for that is even as president of the church, 
he could not afford to buy a normal Book of Mormon for his son and namesake. He had to buy one of the discount versions with errors in it. Wow. So his parents were often gone. The government was after them. Money was often extremely tight. And one of the things that they did often as family, apparently, was to sit around and recount the martyrdom. So he grows up hearing the story of how the founding prophet of his religion and his grandfather were murdered in cold blood. And, uh, you know, that, that, what does that do to a three, four, five, ten year old growing up? So he had, he had this very traumatic childhood. And um, when he went on a mission to England, he's in England, which is this fertile field with thousands of converts, right? And who's he? He is Joseph F. Smith's son. He is the grandson of, and he does not baptize a single person. Oh, wow. Um, all of these traumas, I think, these uncertainties in his life, combined with, again, this is very tentative, but his father said to him on at least one occasion, if we had been true to scripture, these bad things wouldn't have happened to us. And so I think all of these kind of combined to lead him to look for an absolute certain place, and that was Scripture. And so Scripture was this absolute rock that uh, you had to read and you had to be faithful to. And then combined with the strong concordist assumption, that led to him being a young earth creationist. So he was a concordist? Yeah, I, he, I don't even, even on just... his mission, he was already essentially the Joseph Fielding Smith we know. Okay. He, he was... Very knowledgeable about scripture, and he had very strong ideas about how scripture should be read. Okay. So, like Widso and Talmadge and Roberts, he was a concordist, but he took it in a different direction. Right. Um, the difference, and there's, there's not a single term for this, really, um, but in reading Witso, what you can see is the difference is that Witso allowed for several things. He allowed that uh, prophets speak in their own words. They are the ones who have to come up with the language. Um, this is one conception of revelation. God puts the ideas in your head, and then the prophet has to kind of struggle to frame that and express that. And so Witzel allowed for a very human aspect in Scripture. Joseph Fielding Smith didn't. Witzel also allowed for... This is another paper I've done. Witzel allowed for what I call accommodation. That is, when God gives revelation... He is not giving you the answer out of the eternal answer book. God takes his revelation and he puts it down to the level humans can receive, which means even if it's direct revelation spoken verbally to the prophet, there's still going to be humanity in it because God is encoding that into human concepts, human language at the level humanity can receive. Joseph Fielding Smith didn't go for that. Um, so on, on one issue, and I, I don't recall that Witzo says anything about this in particular, but based on what he says elsewhere, he would have allowed it. Joseph Fielding Smith gets asked about the firmament in Genesis. And it is very clear from the Hebrew Bible itself, from the civilizations around the Hebrew Bible, from Jewish, Protestant, Catholic scholars that ancient people in the Mideast, including the Israelites, thought of the sky as a solid dome. Their cosmology was flat earth, solid dome, restraining the cosmic waters above and below the earth. It's, it's the inverse snow globe model. Instead of this snow globe with water inside, you have this snow globe with water outside and this space inside for humans to live. So kind of a bubble almost. Yeah. And when Joseph Fielding Smith writes about this, he says this is absolutely false. No true prophet could ever have such an idea. This is the fault of translators in the Middle Ages and the apostate church imposing this on it, but no true prophet could ever think such a thing. Ancient Israelites knew the truth about the solar system. They knew the planets rotated around the sun. They knew all this stuff. Because for him, if a prophet had those ideas, he couldn't be a true prophet. And so Witza would have said, well, sure he can. What is God really trying to teach here? He is framing it within this ancient language, this ancient setting, he is accommodating it down to their ideas, and Joseph Fielding Smith didn't go for that. So 
But Witso and Roberts and Talmadge were all still concordists. They all still went for the day age theory. They all still went for the idea of pre-Adamites somehow. Um, and, and Smith, on the other hand, throughout his life said, there's no such thing as pre-Adamites. It's not in scripture. Scripture doesn't allow it. They absolutely can't exist. End of story. All this other stuff is just getting into philosophies and theories of men, which are down here and uncertain, against the word of God, which is sure and certain. And here's where his concordism comes in. It's facts. The revelation of God in scripture is facts. And you, when you have facts up against human reasoning, these divinely given facts always win. And he could not understand why people didn't agree with him on that. And he fought with fellow apostles and presidents of the church through his entire life over this issue. Um, but as far as I can tell, he never backed down a single bit unless someone could make a scriptural argument that he was unaware of. Um, so for him, he was very much in the camp of Tertullian. That is, we have scripture, this is God-given knowledge, everything else is irrelevant. Joseph Fielding Smith was with Tertullian? Well, he, he never said that. No, but, I understand. But... Um, to go back with Tertullian and Augustine, the question there are two questions. One is, how legitimate is it to interpret scripture with outside information? And two is, what is the... How should we think of information in Scripture versus information out of Scripture? And Joseph Fielding Smith thought you do not interpret Scripture with outside information because that is importing human knowledge, which is flawed and frail, into pure divine knowledge, which is perfect and ideal. And so in that sense, he's very much in Tertullian's camp, that bringing in human knowledge just pollutes Scripture. It doesn't get us anything. Um, I think most people today, well, you know, in some ways this is a false binary, as many of these things are. But most people today in the church, I think if you asked them and said, um, does learning how to read Greek get us anything in the New Testament over reading in the King James Version? I think they would probably say yes. And in that sense, they would be in Augustine's camp. Um, the second question that I gave you earlier I didn't phrase very well. It is, are science and scripture speaking the same thing? That's a different question than can they be reconciled? So I am I need to split more hairs there, I guess. Um, but in terms of influence, obviously Joseph Fielding Smith lived longer than these other people. Um, and what's interesting is that when he became president of the church, uh, from 70 to 71 for about 18 months, he did not implement any doctrinal changes that pushed in that direction that I have seen. And in fact, I have seen things that suggest the opposite. Um, 1970 is a very interesting point to start looking at. Uh, evolution in the LDS Church after 1970 is also a dissertation idea, and I've done a good bit of work on that. But the other thing that happens in 1970 is evolution starts being taught at BYU as its own class, fully approved by um, the first presidency. So on the one hand, you have a young earth creationist who is the president of the church. On the other hand, you have fairly mature science teaching biological evolution at the university overseen by the young earth creationist president of the church. And... Um, that creates a lot of tension on BYU campus for about the next 25 years. Uh, but there, well, I don't, I don't think I can tell that story publicly. Well, is, there, there are some private things that show that Joseph Fielding Smith still held these opinions. The but I think he had, he had come to recognize that they were at least his views. And um, so he did not get in the way of evolution being taught at BYU. Could it be argued that he was just so old that he didn't have the strength to argue a young earth idea anymore? Uh, that's possible. Um, he was not in great health, but he was still active enough to be doing certain things. Um, it does seem to be the case, uh, people point to President Benson, that presidents of the church who have strong oft-expressed views in certain areas become president of the church 
and they kind of soften those or back off kind of the same way. You know, my dad told me when you're not the bishop, you can be as opinionated as you want. And once you are the bishop, you do not offer your opinions as freely um, because you recognize they are your opinions, but because you're the bishop, that carries different weight in the ward. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Ben Spackman. In our next conversation, we'll talk about creationism. I actually like to bring that up with people who are opposed to evolution. They say, you think we came from apes? And I say, well, you think we came from dirt. Uh, you know, is that really so much better? I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Ben Spackman. We'll have a transcript out shortly on this conversation, and you can purchase individual copies at our website at gospeltangents.com shop. If you want to be the first to get a copy, please subscribe on our website for just $10 a month. I'll send it to you first as a PDF. Or if you'd like a physical copy for $15 a month, I'll be happy to send that to you as well. You can get our transcripts at our Amazon.com author page. I've got a link here, but just do a search for Gospel Tangents Interview and you should be able to find a bunch of them there. Please subscribe at Patreon.com slash Gospel Tangents. For $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview uncut. And for $10, you can get a PDF copy. We've also got a $15 tier where if you want a physical copy, I'll be the first to send it to you. So please subscribe at Patreon or on our website at GospelTangents.com as well. For our latest updates, please like our page at facebook.com slash gospel tangents. And also check our Twitter updates at, at gospel tangents as well. Please subscribe on our Apple Podcasts page at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. Or you can subscribe on your Android device. Uh, just do a search for gospel tangents. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript. And over here we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again.